How could I not fall for a novel whose plot superficially resembles the movie Ghost? <laughs> that, that's not to say, and I, I hasten to add, I'm not trying to suggest that this book was in any way inspired by that movie. Its use of ghosts caught in between is rooted in Sri Lankan folklore, but it's the, the reference that immediately came to my mind when I read this tremendous story. So yes, I've just finished reading The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida by Shehan Karuna Talaka, and I am so excited to discuss this book. I'm going to do my best to avoid giving any spoilers, uh, but it, it's such a great reading experience. There may not be any Odame Brown, <laughs> but there is a more sinister, uh, self-interested medium uh, called the Crow Man, and thankfully uh, the protagonist of this novel is much more interesting than the blandly good uh, pretty boy Sam Wheat. <laughs> Molly Almeida documents atrocity of war in his photography, and he wants tyrants to be held accountable, but he's not a virtuous person. In fact, from page one of this novel, uh, it says that uh, if you had a business card, uh, that this is what it would say, Molly Almeida, photographer, gambler, slut. He accepts work from shady organizations, he loses a lot of money at casinos, and he sleeps around with a lot of men behind his secret partner, Didi's back. He's disillusioned with the government and doesn't attach himself to any particular political organization in Sri Lanka, which is is heavily embroiled in a civil war in the late 1980s when this novel is set. But because of all these complexities and so-called flaws of his character, I just fell in love with him. At the start of the book, Molly wakes to find himself in this liminal space between life and the great beyond. Uh, just like we can't recall birth, he can't recall his death and the events surrounding it. He's instructed by an official that he has seven moons in which to decide whether he wants to enter the light or to remain as a specter amongst the living. So this countdown begins during which he wants to discover who killed him, reconnect with his loved ones, and reveal to the public shocking evidence about a national scandal. There's something really satisfying about reading a novel that's given a very definite structure in this way and moves towards a definite endpoint, and it's really suspenseful how this novel builds to its conclusion. We gradually discover details about his life through people that he haunts, uh, but he also encounters many victims and, and casualties of the war uh, that he photographed during his lifetime. Uh, he encounters their ghosts, and uh, not only them, but he also encounters the ghosts of other people uh, who have committed suicide, who have found life in the country and under the conditions of this war completely untenable. These spirits are raging, and there's this tension between those that want to get their revenge on people who are still alive, and those that want to leave all of the pain of life behind. This is dramatically played out over the course of the novel as Molly becomes familiar with Senna, a deceased man who is hatching a terrorist plot aided by a dangerous demonic spirit, and underlying these tense and fantastical events are these probing questions about our motivations in life and the degree to which we can enact change in the world. Molly has seen enough deception, hypocrisy, and double-crossing coupled with egregious acts of oppression and mass murder to know that no one leader, political organization, or band of people can be trusted with consistent Consistently safeguarding the welfare of the people in his country. A brief list of the primary political groups involved in Sri Lanka's conflict is given towards the beginning of the novel, and this not only slyly tips off Western readers to help them understand the stakeholders and the general motivations of these groups, but also shows how none of these opposing forces are 
good or right. Not aligning himself with any of them makes him an outsider, but he also feels like an outcast because he's a closeted homosexual. Experience has taught him to adamantly deny his sexuality even when it's clear that he's not straight. His infidelity and his many casual sexual encounters are partly caused by this, but also by his puerile justification that it's man's nature to sleep around. Uh, there's this very funny quote where he's having an exchange with his partner and it said, you tell him the pecker is proof that man has no free will. There's a pause and then Dee Dee snorts, that is the lamest excuse ever. This story is narrated in the second person, which makes sense for a protagonist who's been separated from his physical body, but it also grounds the reader in Molly's experience as he struggles to understand the rules of this peculiar afterlife. The means by which he travels through wind and the degree to which the dead can whisper to the living or physically interact with them are bound by certain constraints. This is all handled quite playfully with evocative details like what it feels like to walk through a wall. It's also amusing how the transitory space which which is meant to encourage him into the light resembles this overworked bureaucratic waiting room and ghosts will sometimes do prankish things like make a scientist's bum itch. So the story doesn't feel too hampered by logistics and there were only a couple of scenes where it felt like the author was heavy-handedly whipping Molly's ghosts around to a particular place in order to advance the plot. However, the way in which the afterlife is layered over the realistic world is presented in a genuinely creepy and atmospheric way. There is even one point when this is made personal for the reader and it's observed that there are at least five spirits wandering the space you're in now. One may be reading over your shoulder. These terrifying and twisted spirits uh, appear to Molly uh, quite unexpectedly and the initial horror of seeing them is deepened when learning the, the tragic backstories of these pitiable souls. Molly still has the impulse to document what he witnesses and there are many references in the book how he tries to take pictures with the camera around his neck even though the device is broken and muddied. There's a poignant tragedy to this and the race uh, to allow photographs, incriminating photographs, to be seen by the public. These aspects of the story challenges this general sense we have that if we can witness wrongdoing then it can be corrected. It's revolutionary how images and videos filmed by ordinary people have gone viral and have been widely circulated and this has inspired protests and movements towards change. However, there's a danger that we can become numb to such violent imagery because of our distance from it and we can become overwhelmed by this sense of hopelessness. Can an overwhelming amount of individual tragedy be met with anything but inertia? This novel intelligently probes these issues while not allowing the sense central, suspenseful plot to be drowned by them. My affection for the central character was also formed because there's a love triangle at the center of this novel. Molly doesn't only live with his partner Dee Dee, who's the son of a famous politician and is quite sporty and is kind of a golden child, but they also live with Dee Dee's cousin Jackie, who has this misplaced attraction towards Molly, which uh, finally settles down into this more warm and tender friendship and the way that the dynamic of this trio is presented is really compelling and charming. There's a persistent tragic sense that Molly and Dee Dee's dreams of moving to San Francisco to live freely and openly will never be realized because at the beginning of the novel Molly is dead and this is underpinned by recollections of their relationship and life together and some uh, really beautiful moments that they shared and there's some just great observations about the life of couples that are shown in the book like there's this one quote when it says um, that they had 
a hall lined with books that you and Dee Dee had gifted each other for misremembered birthdays. Neither of you have read the books received as presents, only the ones you bought for the other. And I just love that sense of a couple gifting each other books that really they just want to read themselves. All of these elements combine to produce a big emotional impact and I admire how this novel manages to be both mischievous, thrilling, unsettling, insightful, moving, and just so much fun to read. It's also interesting how the book was originally published in India in 2020 with the title Chats with the Dead. Now it's been published in the UK and it's been long listed for the Booker Prize. The novel is getting a second life and that feels pleasingly appropriate given the nature of the, the story of this book. So what is it going to win this year's Booker Prize? I, I'd be really happy to see it win or at least be shortlisted. I, I think it has a chance of being a really strong contender and a kind of dark horse in, in the race as it's probably one of the books on the long list that people have least heard of um, you know, before the list was announced. Um, so I was really glad to discover this and it's also interesting to think about parallels in the technique of his storytelling, you know, using this darkly comic tone uh, to tell this story which involves you know, real historical um, accounts of like widespread conflict and that's somewhat similar to the technique that Percival Everett uses uh, in his novel The Trees uh, which I have right here and uh, so yeah I think you can make interesting parallels between these two books but you know I, re I loved reading both of these books I I'd love to see them as finalists in the, the Booker Prize this year but, but time will tell but like regardless of any like book competition I think this is an amazing novel I was so happy to read it and I'd really encourage everyone to read it it's it's just such a great reading experience but if you've read this book and if you have any thoughts or feelings about it uh, please let me know about that in the comments below uh, or if you're interested in reading it now I'd love to hear about that but thank you for um, watching me go on about this book because yeah I'm just so excited by it but uh, I hope you're doing well and reading good things I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.